So yeah, thank you so much for joining us this morning for our next recovery program event, which has been designed to support businesses to restart, rebuild and renew. Our biggest challenge has not been technology, but juggling childcare, new routines, homeschooling, motivation, self and others, changing workloads and priorities. The coronavirus kickstarted a change, the world's largest workplace experience in history. In the 60 minute masterclass virtual webinar, Lisa Collin, Director of People and Workplaces at Flagship Group will help you understand the correlation between motivated staff and business results. Walk away knowing how to motivate your staff in uncertain and ever changing times. If you want tips and techniques in motivating remote teams in these unprecedented times, the session will help support you. Following the presentation, there'll be a live Q&A where Lisa will answer your questions. So feel free to pop any questions you have in the Q&A function. If not, you will be able to verbally ask them as well. Um, so yeah, that's everything from me. So I'll now hand over to Lisa um, to share her experience with you. Thanks, Colleen. Well, I'm delighted to be here to talk to you about motivation and to share some things that as flagship group we've been doing both before and during this extraordinary world we now find ourselves in. And when Colleen asked on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce if I could join you to talk about motivating staff, I initially didn't realise it would just be me talking with you. So for this event, I've put together some months and slides which will be available to you to use after this session. And it would be good to have some interaction between us and some shared learning. And looking at the number of us on the call, I've no doubt we can learn loads from each other. So be ready to use the group chat with ideas, points and questions. Um, Colleen, I can't see the group chat at the moment, so you might have to act as our contributor to share some of the thoughts that go in there for me. No but problem. For now, thank you. Sit back, relax, and I hope you will be motivated with some of the things I've chosen to share with you today. I recently saw this quote as part of a poem, which was written and shared by the author Damien Barr on Twitter in late April. The poem is quite long, so I pulled out a couple of sections of it, and I'll just give you a moment to have a read. And it really resonated with me, particularly when thinking about the challenges, setbacks and achievements, whether they be personal or professional over the last seven months or so. So as with many of you, I've had good days and bad, and I've had many good moments and some not so good. However, as we become more accepting of the storm we're in, let's ride those waves and make sure our friends, families, customers and colleagues have a metaphoric boat to sail in. So how does that all relate to what we're here to talk about? Well, as Colleen said, our big, biggest challenge has not been adapting to the coronavirus or adopting new ways of working. But it has involved juggling childcare, embedding new routines with the homeschooling and changing our workloads and priorities and keeping ourselves and others safe. And within that, I see leadership is key. So whatever our role or our position or our industry, a motivation is a direct result of successful leadership and management. And motivation, whether it be for yourself or for others, is probably more important now than ever. And the impact of our leadership and management actions are now much more amplified. And we have a shifting, ever-changing foundation with the world of work, where previous rules and ways of working are no longer the norm. And as leaders, regardless of our seniority position, industry or specialism, we need to consider different ways of engaging, working and motivating with one of our most valued and expensive resources, and that's our people. And our ways of working are now very different. So our start and finish to the working day is often less defined, even where we work and how we get there. Uh, 10 steps from my back door and I'm in my office. If I want to see my colleagues, it's usually through a flat screen as we are today. And if we want to meet in person, it requires almost military planning ahead of the event itself. And we've moved away from those spontaneous interactions with colleagues, finding creative solutions to problems, sensing when somebody needed a bit more support or being able to just grab a coffee and chat. Those things have changed and so must we. But firstly, we recognise some things are totally out of our control. 
but there's still a lot we can do. So let's control the controllable and let's look at what we can do in relation to motivating our staff beyond the curve. The coronavirus kick-started a change, a tsunami or a flipping big tidal wave for sure. And this is probably the world's largest workplace experience in history. So for a moment, I wanna take you back in time and let's look at the history of work and think about motivation in the workplace at those points in time. So in Britain, by the 16th century, the putting out system by which farmers and townspeople produce goods for market in their homes, often described as the cottage industry, was being practiced. And most of the workforce was employed in agriculture, either as self-employed farmers or as landless agricultural labourers. And whilst this image is rather simplistic, it does illustrate the general concept of the cottage industry, for which existed in much of Great Britain from the medieval period until the beginning of the first industrial revolution in the 1700s. So what were your thoughts then? This is where, Colleen, I need your help with some of the thoughts from the team who are on the call. Um, firstly, from the workers' perspective, what do you think their motivation was at this time? Any thoughts? Okay. If you just want to pop in the chat function. Um, obviously, we know that it's going to take a little while for you to type. Um, so we've got John said survival. Colin has said to provide for the family. Anyone else? Uh, Joe said survival. Spot on. And so if you now think about the landowner or the manager, what was what was their motivation at that time? Okay, so, I'll, I'll, oh, I'll keep going. Um, we've got, that we've got we've, some ideas? Yeah, we've got a few. It's just, it's that awkward silence. Now they're all coming in until people uh, write. So Joe said survival, increased profits. Claire said similar, but also for profit. John, to maximise return on rents. And Vincent has said earnings. Oh, fantastic. I knew this would be so much easier with the team all playing a part in this. So you don't just have to sit and listen to me. Thank you for that. Um, absolutely. And it's a lot of that was the physiological need. So it's about productivity. It's about making money for the for the workers. It was about putting food on the table, having the security in their shelter, all those basic needs that as people we strive for. And probably more of a carrot and stick approach from the landowner. Maybe if you do this, I'll pay you that. So possibly quite a transactional, motivational relationship between the landowner and those doing the work. So if we move forward in time to the Industrial Revolution. So around 1760, there was the introduction of the factories and manufacturing and centralization of the workforce. The self-employed moved more into employment and there were benefits that obviously came with that. And then we saw the introduction of management and the rise of the factory system. So with the basic needs being met, people wanted more, which included personal security, employment, resources and health. And employers needed to offer more to attract and retain and increase the productivity within the workforce. Then we had the second industrial revolution, which started around the 1870s. So there were advancements in manufacturing and production um, and technology. The gas and water supply became common and the rollout of the telegraph and the railroad led to unprecedented movement of people and ideas. And it was the very beginning of what we now see as the talent war. So people could change jobs more easily. And that culminated with the production line, the assembly line, the factories using machine tools to increase productivity to newfound heights. And then the third industrial revolution or the digital revolution. So the shift from the mechanical to electronics, and that all started around the 1950s and the proliferation of computers and digital record keeping that continues to the present day. We've still got the factory system. 
The Industrial Revolution that started some 250 years ago gave birth to new manufacturing processes and shifted handcrafted products to mass production by automating and replacing manual labour with machines. And this is still the direction of travel for the world of work. So the motivation for the employer and the employee has changed through that time. It's now more about talent of retention, connections, productivity, and still those financial rewards. And from the employee's perspective, that sense of belonging, that family, that friendship, that sense of connection with a wider group of people. So company hierarchies remain the same as they did in the 17th century with structures based on the feudal hierarchies of old. And I'm sure that we still see some peasants and we also see some kings and barons and lords that are still making the decisions and the rest of us are working our way to try and deliver to them. And people management is still key to any company's success. So motivation and training of staff to do a job. So manual labor, such as answering the phone or producing accounts is critical to any business. And technology is applied to scale people up, increasing the amount of work a single person can do. And this is where most companies are today. So what does all this mean to leading and motivating our people? Well, whilst thinking about the history of work and the motivation of employers and landowners and employees through those various revolutions, I realized our current situation is another workplace experience, but it's one which is now worldwide. Our next revolution may be. And thinking about motivation in the history of work, I was reminded of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, a theory of human motivation by a psychologist, Abraham Maslow in 1943. So Maslow's theory demonstrates that before someone is able to achieve their very best, they have basic requirements that need to be met. So if you think back to the 16th century and the farm laborers and what they need at that time, which was the shelter, the food, the basic needs, as you've rightly pointed out, and how as employees, our needs have been met with each industrial revolution. So therefore, we aspire to the next level. And over time, the world of work has evolved and we've gained and given more to motivate our workforce. The coronavirus situation is no different. I also found this image based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which made me giggle. But we know this is a different time. And we need to think about motivation in a different way to take account of our current ways of working in this ever changing time. So how do we create and sustain motivation beyond the curve or behind the wave? So to start, there are some things that you need to consider. So whatever I share with you today, some things will work, some things won't work for you, but no one size fits all. Different businesses, departments, people with different needs, wanting different things at all times. You need to keep that in the forefront of your mind. And consider your culture. Your culture is as it is. And it may be slightly different right now. The culture comes from people being connected when bonded to similar priorities, interests, and attitudes. So being present in a workplace doesn't necessarily affect culture. It's about feeling connected regardless of the physical space and we'll share some tips and techniques later on in this session. So let's focus on our employees. And here's the business rationale why that's critical to business success, because it's not just a nice thing to do because we're HR and we're lovely people. So it was reported that $1 trillion, and I don't even know how many zeros that involves, was being spent worldwide on looking at the customer journey with just a fraction of that looking at the employee journey. And at Flagship Group, we recognize the correlation between this flow. So the focus being on the customer sat, we're missing a huge part of the process in order to increase profit and growth. So if we start to the very left, the employee satisfaction, if we are creating an environment which totally motivates and satisfies our employees, then they're likely to stay. And if they stay with us, then they're likely to be more expert at what they do and therefore deliver an even better service. The more expert we become, the less effort it takes to actually deliver that service. As a result, 
the customers are delighted. Not only are they getting a sense of the same person dealing with their stuff and they start to show that customer loyalty, they're also getting a better service by more expert, proficient people. That customer loyalty absolutely leads to your profit and growth. And if our employees are satisfied and they're happy and motivated, whatever expression you want to use, then the productivity increases because they become more expert. They stay with you. The cost of replacing them becomes less than the cost of developing them. And therefore, your profit and growth for your business will happen. So there's an absolute correlation between having happy, motivated, engaged, capable people in your business to delighting your customers and therefore increasing your profits and being able to grow. So when we introduced Agile Working in 2017 at the flagship group, we said work is what you do, not where you go. And Agile Working enables us to better manage or even blend our work and our personal lives. And it certainly gave us a head start in adapting to the current time. A number of us have been working from home on a more regular basis now for seven months or so. And it's likely that this way of working, where working from home is your first option um, for those that can, will continue for longer. So whether predominantly working from home, being in an office, on the road or within a factory environment, what I will share today should be transferable across all those places. The principles are the same. So pick out the bits which work for you and keep smiling and nodding at all the rest. And that will keep me, me motivated as we go through. So our approach to motivating our people is focused on what we are calling topic we. So it's an anagram of things to consider when motivating remote teams or those present every day. So topic we stands for team and trust output and productivity, individuality and inclusivity, communication, well-being and engagement. Topic we is also a subtle reminder of while some continue to work remotely, we can still feel like a team, being connected together and inclusive. So let's take a look at the elements making up topic we when motivating teams, individuals as well as ourselves. So teams need to feel connected to each other and with the business. Regular meetings, whether remote or physical, business focused or just having a bit of fun, have helped ensure the teams are pulling together. It also supports individuals remaining connected and everybody has a shared understanding of projects and we're keeping focused on the priorities, which we see as, as a key element of being motivated in the workplace. If I know what else is happening, I'm more in tune, connected and motivated to keep cracking on. Having regular team meetings, focusing on strategic objectives, reviewing recent work and celebrating success, sharing learnings or simply touching base keeps employees engaged and motivated. And to add an element of personal and professional development, as well as keeping our employees engaged and motivated, we vary the way these meetings are run. So let's take a look at just a few ways we do this. So we assign roles, one person to facilitate, one to take notes, one to keep time, others to contribute. And we share that responsibility. And we can often ask for volunteers to do that, but we also then nominate just to keep everybody on their toes for a bit longer. And we look for creative ways to break up the meeting. We use the icebreakers, but we have the team share some of their day or personal insight, for example, their favorite meals. We don't just make it all about business. And we effectively stop and pause at regular interviews. Um, and that allows for questions and comments. We ensure everybody is on the same page. We don't just talk at our people, although I feel that I'm just talking at you today. It is very much about listening to what people say and reading the room, which is much harder when you can't see people or the whites of their eyes. So allow time, a few minutes at the either the start or the end of a meeting to do a check in with everyone to see how they're feeling. And don't just ask if they are OK, because they're likely to say yes. And watch for the nonverbal signs too. So don't be afraid to take an unscheduled break in the meeting or up the energy and sense of connection for the team. Allow time for questions and use the chat functions to give everyone a chance to have their say. So keep it focused, but light. 
And remember, endless team meetings can be draining and not everyone will feel connected. Colleen, is there any comments or points that have gone into the chat room whilst I was rambling on on all of that? Yes, I was just making a note. Um, so John has asked, what is your thinking, Lisa, on the John Lewis partnership business model where employees have a share of the profits and other profit sharing options? Oh, that's a very challenging question. One that I would normally flip back to the individual who asked it, John. But on this <laughs> one, <laughs> I think I think enabling your people to feel a connection where their actions are having a direct impact on both their customers, but also them is a real motivator. You, you're invested. You don't just rock up. You don't just turn up to do the job because of what's in it for you. You actually realize that being part of a team can have a greater impact. Um, I like the business model. It's one that we've looked at. It's not one that we've got with regards to everybody having a share in the business. But if you've all got the same driver to achieve the same thing, then it makes it much easier. It's the, the mass working for the same cause. And if you ultimately benefit from that, um, financial reward is a great incentive. If we didn't get paid, would we carry on going to work? Some would, um, some wouldn't. So I think there is real benefits in keeping people motivated, but I do see financial rewards as a short-term motivation. Yay, I've got a pay rise. That wears off when all the other bits around your day of work are really starting to rub against what you want for you. Oh, we've got another question coming. So in virtual team meetings, I struggle to get my team to participate. What kind of questions should I be asking them instead of how are you? Okay, ones, ones that I've asked, um, which is then created an amazing list for me is, so what series are you watching at the moment? Um, I, I haven't exhausted Netflix yet, but I'm thoroughly enjoying that, uh, that purchase. So I think talking about what did you do at the weekend is always a, a question which makes me really nervous because some weekends I do very little. And then I feel that I'm a very shallow person when I say I just sat around, painted my nails and watched some TV. But they're the things I don't do in a busy work week. Um, I ask uh, how the family are, which is always a really good question because then it's not quite about you. Or if you can remember the names of the family members or something happened with somebody in that meeting and then ask them about that to share or highlight something great that's happened at work. So you start to celebrate success. So you create an energy in the room, which is not just about um, this is the work and this is what we're trying to achieve in this meeting. So make it personal, but be aware of the boundaries. Um, make it non-personal by so what's for supper tonight and people can usually talk around what they're having for tea what series are you watching on tv or what's the funniest thing you've seen in the last 24 hours or heard and try and get people engaged that way by allocating them activities so okay mary moo today is going to chair the meeting and johnny joe you're going to take the notes and getting other people to take a different role in a meeting is sometimes quite helpful because they also don't know when you're going to choose them. So they have to stay alert. Love that. Um, and then, oh, so Alice says, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and then I've got a question. So when you said um, to look out for the nonverbal signs, some people might not know what those are. So can you give some examples of what nonverbal signs that you should be looking for if a team member isn't motivated? Absolutely. So if you see somebody withdrawing, so not everybody wants to say something, especially if you're on a, a, a remote team call, not everybody wants to talk. We have the extroverts and we have the introverts and we have the ones in between. So it's it's about looking for when a behavior changes. If somebody is withdrawing, if somebody is not engaging if somebody is changing the way 
that they react, whether it's they're not joining in with a conversation. If you're doing a round robin and you're going around the room asking everyone to contribute an idea, if every time they have nothing to contribute. So look out for those withdrawal moments with those changes in behavior with the people not wanting to join the call. Another basic thing is um, we have phones and I will cover this in the presentation, but we I do everything and when somebody is calling me now it's always face to face it's always the screen and sometimes people are choosing to not turn the screen on so you can't see them so if that's happening more regularly then that could be another indicator but anything which you're starting to see where you think oh someone's withdrawing somebody's not joining in somebody's not looking as well as they were all those mental health issues as well then don't be afraid to ask them and ask them more around, you know, what have you been doing? What's how are the family? Tell me about what, you know, what's your favorite meal this week? And just get them to open up. Don't just say, are you okay? Because those people who are struggling are more likely to go, yep, I'm fine. And then just start talking to them. It might just be that they need to feel that they can say, I'm having a really tough time. The only other thing that reminded me, Colleen, with that question is I put a note out to my team very early on saying I'm having I'm having a, a rubbish time. I nearly swore there. I'm having a rubbish time. Um, I've really suffered. I've really struggled getting to terms with keeping engaged with people whilst I'm I'm working remotely and and actually showing that sense of vulnerability. And I was absolutely bowled over with I just by just putting that out there, my team felt that I'd given them permission to say something similar. And they they came back in their droves with telling me how they've challenged themselves, things that they found more difficult, things that they wanted to be able to do and needed more help with. But I gave them permission because I was showing my own vulnerability. And there is that line. But I showed my own vulnerability in saying, you know, not every day is a great day. And I can talk about it with the team now and again, which enabled them to feel that they could talk to me about them not having a great day. Thank you. That's great. Um, so Colin has said, I like the idea of different people chairing. I sometimes do not notice changes. The team are great at letting me know something is different after afterwards I do notice a lot but not all I guess that's everyone aren't we we're only human yeah. and I have to say to my team I, I look for the signs but sometimes I'll miss it because I might be wrapped up in my own world or I might be just really super busy so tell me I don't mind how you tell me just tell me even if it's just a one word even if it's just a can we do a call and encourage them to help you motivate and lead them you can carry on there's no more questions okay um, I may have covered some of this so we can skip over it as we keep going then so collaborative working remains important especially whilst working remotely so ensure that people still feel part of a team which was what we were then talking about and we've heard from several employees that they feel collaborative working has even improved since the increase of remote working as employees in different offices no longer feel isolated. And it was something I hadn't envisaged. We, we've got a number of offices around East Anglia and people work in their own little bubble. And now our bubbles have got smaller, especially with the remote working. But because we've had to go out of our way to now engage with other people, it's actually increased that collaboration. And so ask the team to look out for each other and to feel comfortable in saying they need help or they are having a bad day. If we look after them, they're more likely to look after our customers. So where to meet? Our offices are open and although they have limited capacity, we are having some people go in. Um, those who have worked in the offices are saying they felt safe and protected, but the atmosphere was different. And that's been some of the biggest challenge for people think, oh, the offices are open. We could go back and be with other people. Well, obviously, there are much less people in there. There's less noise. There's less facilities. And it's not how they thought it would be. 
And remember, not everyone will want to come into an office for a team meeting. So ensure that if you are coming together, that individuals can still dial in and feel part of it, even if they aren't there in person. And we also set up walk and talk meeting routes. So we designed a number of um, walk routes which had different time frames. So there was a 15 minute walk group and there was a two hour walk group uh, to enable people to then come together, safe distance, but work collaboratively whilst out in nature and counting those steps. And that's been really powerful because it has helped with the one-to-one -one connections, but it's also helped with the mental well-being of our people. Um, just as a, just a tip, if you are arranging one-to-one -one meetings and you're doing three back-to-back -back and they're all walking routes, remember you're the one doing walking for three one-to-ones. Um, take it from someone who went there and did that. So output and productivity. So since we're no longer able to judge input as easily as we were when we could see our teams, so in terms of presenteeism or time at a desk, we're measuring performance and the impact on output and productivity. But what does that mean and how does it work? The organisations that thrive in a remote working environment are those that give their staff two things. The technology required for staff to work as easily and seamlessly as possible and the trust required to not rely on presenteeism and the stress and ineffectiveness this can cause. So rather than judging people based on the time they spend at a desk, measure and manage their performance based on the output and impact of the work they produce and complete, as well whether expectations are being met and the outcome of work. So. That was the biggest challenge for us with moving to Agile Working. And it wasn't for the staff to say, um, I've done this, I've worked on this, I've delivered that. It was more for the managers saying, but I can't see where Mary Moo is working or not. Actually, getting them to focus on the output of the activity or the output of work and the impact of work is a much harder concept then, well, I can tell Mary Moo's working hard because she's been at her desk for the last eight hours. Actually, she may not have been doing any work at all. Mary Moo is my favourite character. She's not actually an employee of ours. So it really does switch it on its head. You trust your people to do what you need them to do. And you sometimes have to look in on yourself on why you might not trust your people. And you can talk to HR about the specifics there. But it really is about, can I trust my people to get on and deliver what I need them to deliver? And the impact of what I'm asking them to deliver, regardless whether it took them three hours or five hours. So you start managing the output rather than the input. And that's a very challenging uh, concept but it starts with trusting your people. So we all remember the time of, oh, you're working from home, are you? Well, that's become the norm for so many of us. And when we're working from home, we are jolly well working and we're balancing childcare and we're being able to put the washing out in between and we have a better work-life balance or we're working even harder, depends who you are. But if performance is slipping, so if you're managing the output rather than the input, if performance starts to slip, then ask what's behind that. Is it the environment they're working in? What could be done to set them up for success? What barriers are they experiencing? And most importantly, listen to what they say. So in order to manage and measure performance, you need to be clear what success looks like. Determine and agree with the team and individuals the measurable outcomes of their work. So the timeframes that they're working to, the accuracy of their, their productivity, um, have really clear objectives. Make sure the communications are strong and regular and, and make time for creativity. So both you and the employees are clear on what to expect and what great looks like. So for those who are working remotely, we are unable to assess input, AKA time at desk, as easily as we are in the office. However, we're still able to assess the output. Are your team delivering the same amount that they were? Is the quality of work as good as it's always been with when they were in the office? 
Has this increased due to a lack of distraction? Has this decreased? And if so, make sure that it's addressed during one-to-one -one communication. Try to identify the blockers and discuss different ways of working and ensure you ask for feedback on their experience, challenges and ways of working. Don't just assume you know. So we're at topic we, we've done the T, the O and the P. So the I comes next. It's all about us as individuals. So regardless of your place of work, to keep our people motivated, we keep a focus on them as individuals. And this gets harder the bigger your workforce, but it is possible. And we've currently got over 1,300 employees and we're treating them as individuals. That's really important to us. We do this by having regular one-to-one -one interactions. And this is still possible whilst working remotely, whether this be performance or well-being focused, both are essential. And we are deliberate about checking in but also think about the pace and rhythm of that so it fits with the individual needs. If I called Mary Moo on a Monday at nine o'clock every day, every week, it's too routine. Mary might not want to talk to me on a Monday at nine o'clock every week. And she just knows that it's in my calendar to call her on a Monday at nine o'clock. It depersonalizes it. So make sure you understand what that individual needs, the frequency, the pace, the rhythm. Do they just want to touch base for a 10 minute call? Do some people need more support for a longer period of time? Tailor your behavior to the individual. And it starts with knowing a bit more about that individual. So learn about them as a person and connect with them. If you connect with them, they'll connect with you and the business. And don't be afraid to have non-work conversations at times. Things about meals, latest TV viewing, their families, as we said. So we're moving to the C, the communication. Fundamental to motivating or the reverse, demotivating employees. And not just what you say, but how you say it. And when I'm sharing all these things and these tips and techniques, trust me, I've learned the hard way in so many of these situations. But it's not also just about what I do to others. It's what others do to me. So when we're talking about this, don't just sit here thinking, this is how I need to treat my team. This is also what I need as an employee, because each of us have a boss. Um, so think about what do you need? And then it makes it easier to ask others what they need from you. And there are lots of different ways to communicate, but think about what works for the individual what they see, what they experience, what their preferences are. Do they want to visualize something? Do they want to hear something? Do they want to read about something? So tailor all of the needs and ensuring inclusivity. If you're just putting videos out all the time, make sure that you're thinking about those that have um, prefer to read something. Think about those that have hearing challenges that need to have some script. Think about tailoring it so you are inclusive to your entire workforce and not just to what works for you. And there are lots of platforms out there for communications, including Teams, Zoom, which we're on now, Yammer, WhatsApp. And a point to note, which I touched on earlier when using Teams or Zoom for the call, a lot of people have mobile phones. and We don't always need to activate the video when calling. Sometimes a call is just enough. Um, but also look out for when sometimes they're not taking the video, even when you're asking them to, when before they were. That is a change of behavior. And be mindful of employees withdrawing and never using their videos, though, as I'm saying. Um, a walk and talk meeting is also a great way of communicating whilst following the COVID restrictions. And might be the best option if you have concerns about a member of your team and just want to check in on their well being. So I'd like to throw it back over to you at this point. Have you found any other methods that have really helped your teams with communication since the pandemic first hit? So just pop them in the chat function or if it's easier for you to verbally say it, then just let me know and I can give you audio. Um, what's the word? Approval? Permission? And I appreciate this might take a little while, 
um, for people to pop in the chat function, but that's fine. So Caroline has said, oh, I love this. Um, we have a team speaker a couple of times a week on Teams, just a chance to chat and catch up. I like that. I do. Has anyone been to um, the Fika? Have you been to Fika in Norwich, Lisa? No. There's, no a place, there's a really good coffee place. It's only tiny. Um, it's down. Oh, I'm really bad with names. It's kind of, oh, where is it? But near the glass house, mm -hmm. it's a kind of ribs of beef way. Um, and they do really good coffee and cake. So <laughs> maybe you could go there for your um, coffee and catch up. Um, Claire said, we've been having virtual coffee catch up sessions. And Alyssa said, we have informal coffee catch ups where there's no work agenda at all. We can just log in and chat for half an hour. Uh, that's great. Um, just be conscious of if people then feel it's compulsory or not. Be really clear on if you're free, dial in. So it's not felt that we have to dial in or we'll be judged. Um, so it might sound obvious, but it's important to encourage staff to communicate with you openly and honestly to share learning or to raise concerns. Um, and it might be concerns about their workload, their well-being or their day to day tasks. And, and ask yourself if your culture enables people to be open and encourage discussions about well-being. If not, then why not? What is it that you're doing or not doing, which is um, which is enabling that not to happen? And with less visibility or a lack of openness between colleagues and managers, employees may feel more anxious about doing so than if they were in the office and they were able to talk to you face to face. So communicate your willingness to be contacted by them if they need you. And if you feel like your interactions with your team have potentially become quite transactional and purely work related, which can happen to all of us when things are busy, then make yourself time out for your next call or face to face chat with them to ask how they are, how they're finding work at the moment and whether they have any concerns or things that are affecting their well-being. And also ask them about their colleagues. Is there anyone that they've got concerns about? Because that might be another way for them to then start opening up and talking about themselves. So well-being, we're at the last two bits, the W and then the E. Well-being, the hierarchy of needs helps us visualize some of the items that are intrinsic to well-being. So the pyramid demonstrates that before someone is able to achieve their very best, they have those basic requirements that need to be met. And well-being starts with safety. So make sure your staff are utilizing the guidance from health and safety to both protect themselves, their families, their customers and the wider community. Think about the home workstation, conduct regular check-ins with your team on whether their home workstation is still effective. And if they're doing customer and site visits, if your team are required to visit those operational sites from time to time, ensure they've read and understood the related guidance that they have been provided with appropriate PPE. Look after them and they'll look after each other and your customers. So engagement, the last letter of topic we, Keep employees engaged, especially whilst working remotely. And that means you need to focus on the same things that you would whilst in the office. So growth and challenge ensure that your employees are engaged in their day-to-day -day work, review their development needs and seek training opportunities. We've held a number of lunch and learn sessions where people can just dial in and get trained and learn about new topics. And they've been they've been offered to the board members, to every member of staff and now even some of our customers. And they've been so popular because people are hungry to learn and feel that we're still investing in them and still developing them. And don't forget to recognize staff. Make sure that you still focus on recognizing good work, even though some people aren't together. It's important to make sure people are up to date on what's going on across the team and where people have delivered on projects that may or may not affect others at work. Celebrate those successes and also get the teams to nominate each other. So it's not just one way traffic. 
And as you've rightly pointed out, have a space for chatter. If you use any of the virtual collaboration apps such as Microsoft Teams, you can create a dedicated channel for your team to discuss the kind of non-work related items they're discussing in an office environment. And don't forget your new starters. Recruitment is still happening. How do you actually induct somebody new into the business? And you've got to work a little bit harder and a little bit differently to make sure that they still feel part of it. We've had people inducted um, through this time who felt really supported, really engaged. And yeah, they got thrown in at the deep end, having to suddenly be on a Teams call or be on a pub crawl in different rooms in different houses. And they'd only just joined the team, let alone built up trust and time with them. But make sure that you are talking to those individuals and making sure that you are listening to what they want, as well as telling them what you can do. And and share, trial the best way of you keeping your team informed and updated on the latest news or updates for your business area with the wider group so you learn from each other. If you've done something in your business or in your team that's had huge success or gone horribly wrong and you want to learn from that, you can bet your bottom dollar that one of your colleagues is probably doing something similar. So work with other colleagues that you wouldn't normally work with, other managers, other teams, to, to take the best bits of what they've done or not done and, and take them for your own. So create virtual social events um, if your team work entirely remotely and are potentially located across a large geographical area. Create those virtual social events. I mean, Quizzes kind of burn out fairly quickly, but escape rooms or drinks and meals together. Make sure you keep a balance of some events during working hours, maybe over a lunch break, for example, or at the end of a team meeting, and some events outside of working hours. And remember, not everyone is the same. We are all individuals, so do tailor your ways of working to the different members of your team and how they learn and work to ensure they have an inclusive working environment that gets the best out of them. So in summary, create time for creativity and innovation. Make sure to speak to at least one person in a week where you don't have a work-based goal and you just have time for being you. Pinpoint the underlying appeal. If you have teams that get energy from team lunches or dress down Friday or sports activities together, then do more of it. And make time for team to connect, to contact you as they would drop by in the office and share the one-to-one -one comms are available. Have those team meetings and utilize the chat function for the less extroverted people. And focus on the bigger picture rather than being bogged down in business as usual. Why do we do what we're doing? Keep a focus on work outside of the immediate workload so they can see the part they play and how it relates to the bigger picture. Reward, recognize both financial and non-financial and celebrate success. Frequently check in with individuals and be deliberate about checking in and think about the pace and rhythm so it fits with the individual. Actively ask if they have any questions or concerns and share stories, good, bad, learnings, opportunities, risks, celebrations and closure. Be the storyteller and encourage them to do the same. And also create a commute. If your team is struggling with the lack of structure in their days, encourage them to create a fake commute that consists of either a walk, a run, a bike ride, or maybe some time in the garden or reading a book. That drive home at the end of the day was therapeutic for me. I no longer have that. 10 steps and I'm back in the door. So take some time for life admin. Um, and that's a perceived pressure of presenteeism, always being online, can become an issue for remote workers in particular. Encourage your team to take a break during the day and to use their annual leave and take a virtual coffee break with colleagues. One of the biggest differences between office working and remote working is that the latter can result in a loss of off the cuff conversations and relationship building opportunities. Think motivating teams consider topic way teams output productivity individuals communication well-being and engagement thank you that was great so we've got some um just to say if you've got any more questions pop them either in the q a or the chat chat function sorry and um, we've had some 
chat come through, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I just need to find it again. I can see the chats now. I've taken my screen off share. Thank you. So um, Vincent, I thought was really interesting. So they do a virtual coffee break with someone bringing along a surprised object to chat about. Mm. Um, so I asked what surprised objects have been brought. Um, and he said, where is it? Uh, one funny one was an egg painted up as the program manager and someone else showed the tree house built from the kids, which <laughs> I thought was great. Um, someone else, so Colin says that he gets his team to block out two hours per week on their calendar. This is to stop people contacting them and it's their own time, which is really nice. Um, so we have got a couple of questions. So Pete says, um, I have one-to-ones via Zoom, but I'm interested in the walk-in one-to-ones. How do you do this? A 15-minute telephone walk? No, we, <laughs> we have done that in person. So you have the, the route mapped out or you can just choose any route you wish and you keep your, your six feet apart and you walk side by side wearing your mask in a safe place and you conduct your meeting that way. So there's some beautiful walks around the local areas. Um, it's, some have been in the country, some have been near the individual's home and I've just traveled to them. But you've got to make sure that both parties are comfortable with doing that. We've not done more than a one-to-one -one as a walk and talk. And as I said, um, having booked three one-to-ones back to back, I was the one that was walking and I got extremely wet walking around the University of East Anglia and, and the areas around there. But it's really powerful because it, it gets you out in the fresh air. It gets you in a different environment and makes you feel more connected. Love that. I, I did make a note and I'm going to post something on LinkedIn because I love that idea. Um, so Caroline says, Lisa, can you tell us how you have delivered induction virtually? OK, so what we've done, Caroline, is we have set up their whole week's worth of an induction. So we do a full week induction and we get people to travel around to all of our offices to see all of our departments and see all of our functions. So we do repairs and maintenance. We do gas. We do housing. We do all central services activities as well. But what we've done is we've paired individuals up with a buddy from each of those departments. So they have a call. They have a call so they can still understand with that person what goes on in their part of the world and the part they play, their department plays, their function plays in providing homes for people in need. So they've got that full experience. And if they can join a team call, they're then also getting to meet virtually the team in that department. And so it takes a bit more planning. Um, we've had some physical visits as well, uh, but also being absolutely covered safe and making sure that everybody is comfortable and where people have said I don't physically want to go to an office right now I don't feel comfortable with that we've not forced it we've done it virtually but we've also made sure that they're joining the team meetings with their own team that they've got allocated a buddy that they feel connected to so somebody that they can ask the silly questions to what do we do in this situation how do I get that things you don't necessarily want to reveal to your new line manager. And so we've, we've done a lot of hand holding without physically holding hands. Love that. Um, so I think the final question, because I'm just conscious that it's 11.27. Oh, sorry. I love it when people put stuff in the chat function. So Pete says, do you have any recommendations for escape rooms? open brackets, virtual social events. Social events. Um, our IT team do some virtual escape rooms, which have been brilliant. I will see if I can dig out the ones that they did, um, but they, they were really positive about it. I will find, I will find that and I'll, I'll let you have the details, Colleen, so you can then put it in the, share it with the slides. Perfect, thank you. And I'm just reading what Rachel has just sent. Really useful. It helped me realise that we have been doing some of these things now. Um, okay, but I'll read this all. Really useful. It helped me realise that we have been doing some of these things now. We are all working more remotely, but have 
but you have also given me ideas on what other things we can do. I really like the walk in one to ones as long as it isn't raining. Yeah, uh, totally agree with you. Gives Sorry. you something to talk about. Uh, the British always talk about the weather, so it doesn't matter. If, if we stopped ourselves doing things because of the weather, we'd do nothing. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, we, oh, I found it really useful. I hope you did. I made some notes as well. Um, as I said in the chat function, I'll share with you a copy of Lisa's presentation. Um, and I'll also share any virtual escape rooms um, once Lisa finds out which one they've used. I've done one myself as well. So I'll um, try and find the website that we did it and we thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I guess another thing you can do, obviously, with Halloween coming up, although this is a bit short notice, is you could do a pumpkin making competition. You could easily do that together, socially distance, or just encourage your employees to buy a pumpkin, decorate it, and then, I don't know, maybe have an incentive. Whoever does the best um, pumpkin gets some sort of prize. It's something they can do with the kids because it's half term as well. Um, just, yeah, get creative. So we really hope you enjoyed um the session. I'll also share the recording when it's available as well. So yeah, it's just to say a massive thank you for joining us. Um, and I really hope that we get to see you soon. And um, Lisa, did you want to say a final farewell? I just want to say thank you for staying with me. And uh, I couldn't see if anyone dropped out of the call. But I do appreciate you taking an hour out of your day to listen to uh, what what my thoughts are on motivating our people beyond the curve. So thank you very much. Perfect. Well, enjoy the rest of your day and your week. Hopefully the weather will get better. And yeah, let's hope we see you soon. Thanks. Bye.